so Lamont and I had a little bit of a debate because, you know, he's wrong half the time and so am I. That's uh, fair. About, right, that's good. <laughs> about this strain of the coronavirus uh, not coming from China but from Europe. Did you see that story? I saw that story. Um, so with the strains, there's been a, a, a little bit of um, some scientific, I guess, disagreement. Because we did hear that there were an L and S variations of the coronavirus that had mutated. Right? The original strain was the S and then the L. And now they're saying there are sub subdivisions of that, maybe, but some people are saying it's not significant enough for you to identify the you know, for it to be important. So there 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 wouldn't be a change in terms of ge- they call that genetic drift that you know, as the virus goes along and you have these little changes in it, nothing significantly has happened in the change for you to be like, oh, this is something different. Or, oh, this is something new. So they're still trying to get that information right now, you know? Hmm. I said it doesn't matter where it came from. Does it matter where it came from to you as a doctor? It doesn't matter. For me, it doesn't matter. In terms of taking care of people, in terms of, the, the science of it, it doesn't matter where it came from. Realistically, it's like, well, what are we going to do right, right, right now and, mm. and moving forward? You know, I think some of the stuff, we, we can be absolutely honest, right? We know some of the stuff like the China virus was, was related to the politic- politicization of this entire thing, right? We've been in, interjecting, not we, and I can just be frank, our leadership has been interjecting politics into a major medical crisis for the the entirety of this time. So this whole thing was about our China virus and all that. That was not anything medically related. That had nothing to do with it, you know? So um, so we're just trying to get through. Um, I was sharing with Lamont earlier that one of my students, her mom has it. And, you know, she's been quarantined for quite some time and she's very anxious about it. And it led me to the question, like, what happens after this is over? How do we know if we're healthy? Like, what does getting back to to good health look like? You know, when when the spike happens and we finally level off and maybe we come back to opening up some things, maybe in June, maybe end of May, I don't know. How do we know if we're safe, Dr. Damas? That is, so this is something that I personally am, am troubled by. Uh, and I've been saying this, and a lot of people in the medical and scientific community have been saying this, that we just haven't been getting enough information. And without, like, that information, you don't really know what to do. You're kind of just taking shots in the dark. We still don't have adequate testing. So there's a whole bunch of people walking around who are infected who we don't know of. So that without that information, we don't know where the hot zones are. So we don't know where to allocate resources. We don't know how to project things. On top of that, we don't have a serology test. The serology test is the test that sees if you've developed antibodies to the infection, right, once you've recovered from it. And so if you had these antibodies, the theory is that you, have, you then have protection. Right? We'd have to check that out. That's why they want to donate plasma and do all that stuff. Mm. We don't have that test. So then how would we know, for example, let's say Lamont, you know, heaven forbid, was to have been an asymptomatic carrier, right? He never had anything. He was a carrier, and then he recovered. I can never test. If I never test him, I don't have that information. I don't know what to do with him. You know, like, all right, dude, I guess. Go for a walk. We'll see what happens, right? And then let's say I was someone who had been infected, and then, I, you know, I recovered, right? It wasn't a major thing. There's, I could be shedding the virus, which means that I can still be giving off the virus, for several days after I feel great. Like, oh, man, I got over it. I'm feeling all right. I can be giving this off for a long period of time. We don't even know how long that period of time is, right? So some of it is kind of up in the air, and that's, you know, I think that's what a lot of physicians and a lot of scientists are having issues with right now is like, dude, you know, the fundamentals of how these things are supposed to be run aren't being, um, you know, followed through with. Yeah. All right, so my question is, you you acknowledge that there could be more than one strain. So mm-hmm. if there's more than one strain and we're seeing different regional hotspots in the country, is that also saying that there's more than one treatment? Like, let's say they get up there in the press conferences every night and they're talking about these are things you can do, and, and this we're doing drug trials here, blah, blah, blah. 
one thing could work for one strain that doesn't work for the other. Is is that correct? That, that is that is you know potentially correct. That would we would have to have strains that will be so different apart from one another. For example, the S and the L strains. Initially, they were saying one was more contagious and one was more um, virulent. You know, one would get you sicker, but one would you know transfer from person to person. So that could kind of mitigate what it is. But I think what they're seeing recently now is that it's just predominantly the L strain. We don't have a treatment. That's the bad thing uh, right now. <laughs> there, there is no treatment. There is nothing. That hydro- I, you know, I've been telling you guys this stuff from the beginning. That chloroquine stuff is a wild goose chase. There's no evidence for it. Even the paper that that stuff was pu- published in, those people came back and was like, looking at this stuff again, this doesn't meet our standards. You know, so there is no treatment right now. We're just, you know, I think a lot of doctors, if you're like in the medical service and you, you're, you're on like the website, so you listen, a lot of people are communicating to themselves and saying, what's happening to you in Detroit? What's happening to you in St. Louis? What do you see what over you there? Trying? You know, yeah. what are you trying? Right. So that's how they've gotten like proning people, which has helped people breathe a little better. That's how they start to see that. This may be an inflammatory thing. It may not be the virus itself causing the pneumonia, but it's your body's reaction to the virus, which may be a reason why we're seeing people with, who are having like organ failure, kidneys. And in China, they were talking about people having myocarditis, which is an inflammation of your heart t- tissue. So, you know, people kind of like, I guess you have patchworking, you know, things as opposed to having this one big umbrella that would tell us, hey, you know, put all this together and then do this. So if they do um, at some point, which they will at some point, tell us it's safe to go back out into the world, should we all demand a test before we go back to work or go back to society? You may not have a choice. I think, yeah, Germany, I think Germany has proposed something like that, some sort of like card or certificate. I I even think Bill Gates had spoken about something about like that, that, you know, if you've had, you know, testing, that shows that you have immune, immunity to it, like you have these immunoglobulins in your blood, that you'll be okay. Uh, and then, or if a vaccine is developed, then you would either have to prove that you have the vaccine or that. That's getting a lot, right? I can see some people don't like the idea of big no, brother. No, well, like I the, mean, listen, I, I, had an immun- I had an immunologist <laughs> on yesterday talking about, you know, vaccinations for the flu, the regular flu virus, which I've never gotten. And she said, you're benefiting from herd immunity. And I'm okay with that, even though I know there's a level of selfishness in it. But, you know, again, as a black person, yeah, yeah, we, we, but we have a history here of distrust of medicine and like vaccination. Yeah. So I just, you know, it's built into our DNA to be like, oh, wait a minute, you're going to vaccinate us. Huh? Wait, what, what, what are your thoughts? Please either give us some insight or allay our fears. All right. So I would say that as a, you know, as a black person myself and understanding our history, you know, going way back with results of colonization and slavery, we know that we've been taken advantage, more than taken advantage of, right? And then going on through here in America, there's been systemic disenfranchisement. There have been things that have been done to us that haven't been done to other communities and been to our detriment. So it's not abnormal. There's nothing wrong with us being distrustful. How many times somebody got to do something for you? Do you be like, nah, I'm not messing with you. I know what you do. Like, I know how you get down. So I don't think, like, as a black person, you know, there's something wrong or abnormal with that. You know, I think that is being wise. That's being prudent and saying, I know this is, you know, how things get down here. The second thing is if you look at the chaos that's going on, like, you know, with the response to this, how could you really have any faith in what's going on when you've got political leaders talking about medical stuff and not allowing the experts be experts, right? So if I'm a person sitting at home and I'm like, how can I trust you guys when you can't even, you can't even get the first piece of this together? I can't believe a word you're saying. So all of what you're saying, I would say, I would be hesitant. If it was me, let's say if it was my kids or something, and there's a vaccination in a couple of years, I'd be like, I don't know, you know. And even this talk about experimenting in Africa, 
This kind of stuff doesn't yeah, help. I mean, it's, yeah, it's those French doctors. Like, yeah. You know, stuff is preposterous. Like, no, I'm not messing with Well, they apologize, like though, Dr. Damas. They apologize for oh, that. Oh, my fool. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Like, for, for being caught. For being That's caught. Work. <laughs> like, caught I, right? <laughs> These guys right. were so cavalier about yeah, it, too. Yeah, but, but, you know? but, but Bill Gates, Bill Gates is, is an outward proponent of all of that, and he's been actively involved in that. So he should I do would, it first. I, and let us know how it turns <laughs> out. I, I yeah. wouldn't, you know. I would say this, right? Let's look. Let's use the chloroquine thing as an example, um, and I'll use sports, right? Like, you can't have the team owner calling plays, right? You can't have Jerry Jones in the booth calling down and say, "We need to run this play," and everybody's like, "That's not how football is played." Well, that's right? what he does. That's why they're losing ass Cowboys. That's, that's why, why they lose. They lose. Losing right? asses. That's why they suck. Because somebody who who's not qualified to do things is doing things, right? So, and what do you see as the result of it? Nothing. Nobody, you know, we've been doing this Clarkin thing for two weeks now. No data has come out from anywhere. People still die in droves in New York, in Italy, in Spain, right? So like, they've got access to it, too. And, they're still, and we're still talking about this? Come on, man, you're killing me. Like, I'm sitting there like, you guys are killing me with this chloroquine thing. And heaven forbid you should speak out against it. Now you're a bad guy for telling the truth. These are the fundamentals. This is straight up fundamental stuff. You don't do, you don't do, you don't, you don't, you know, you don't present a treatment unless you go through trials. You don't do that. That's just the way things like, you know, it's right. just the fundamentals of things. And when you break down your fundamentals, what do you do? You have what they call in sports, you know, uncharacteristic mistakes. So turning the ball over, you're fumbling, you're doing all of that. That's what we're doing that's right now. That's where we are right now. Mm. To it. That's what we're doing. All right. So given that, given that reality, um, it looks like because the governor of New York has been very methodical in, uh, and very truthful, actually, in handling this pandemic here, there seems to be a flattening happening. Now, in order for that to sustain itself, people have to continue to do what they're doing. Mm. I'm looking at church. Uh, Easter Sunday's coming up. We got Good Friday tomorrow. We're in the middle of this uh, Passover season. There's churches uh, that are still going to be holding service. There's one in Louisiana. This guy is still at it, even though he's been arrested. He's like, I'm having church. Nothing you could do about it. God will, the blood of Jesus will, will, will compel us. So I, if, if we're dependent upon people to, to behave like adults, sentient adults, Yet we live in America, where that seems to be in short, <laughs> short supply. How, those yeah. of us who are actually doing it, how do you know? What do we, how do we reconcile with this? I, I would say one of the things is to you know they say what's the saying? They say um, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. So if you look at what the Chinese have done over in Wuhan, they shut that place down. They have a culture where already that they were used to wearing masks all the time. Right. We didn't do that for some reason or another. And we're still kind of like, oh, like, like, you know, I don't know about this mass stuff. But if you look at their response to it and what they've done, and if you say, OK, if we want to, you know, have some sort of measure of success for ourselves, what worked for them? Let's mimic that. Communism. You know, everybody where. <laughs> yeah. Being, being able to monitor that's everybody. That's what I'm being able saying, to control say, everybody's look, movement. Go, yeah, that's what worked. Or, or I'm not we, could do this. we could do this. Listen, I'll tell you this, right? You talk about the church thing, right? I mean, you got to be, uh, you're going to have a certain amount of knuckleheads, right? We all know that we're going to have a certain amount of knuckleheads. You can't help it, right? But there's a certain amount of, there's a, enough of us that have common sense that know that this is not a good look for you. Like right now, this is not a good look for you. And if you go out, it's like my mom used to tell me, I grew up in Flatbush, like, you don't need to be out on the streets. It's dangerous. Like, it's, it's dangerous. It's not safe. If you go out there, something bad is going to happen to you. Yep. I got into a lot of fights in Flatbush, right? Bad things happen. So eventually, sometimes I'd be like, Ma, I want to go outside. And she'd be like, nah. And I'd be like, you know what? You're right. <laughs> I think I'm going to chill today. And I think. We need a certain amount of that amongst ourselves. We got to police ourselves. If we got a society that we can't even do basic stuff, this is like nobody's asking you to, to, to lay your life on the line and go 
you know, fight off some invading force, you know, saying of alien, chill. Like, literally, that's never been bad advice. Nobody's ever told you to chill out, and you've been like, you know what? I wish I want to listen to him when he told me to chill out. That's always good advice <laughs> to chill out, right? So if we could just chill out for a little bit and let this thing kind of settle down, right, and some of us who are infected build up immunity to it, you know, some of us asymptomatic carriers build up or people who've been infected build up immunity, we can start to develop that, that herd immunity kind of thing because then we're not transferring it to people. But if we go out and start chasing that almighty dollar, whether it's in the church pews or it's in the grocery stores or whatever, then go ahead, go serve that God, and he's going to give you what you ask for. All right, so real Uh-oh. quick, and I, I'm, I can't remember if we talked about this before last time, but I want to I wanna kind of put it to put it to bed and, and just get your opinion on it. Um, 5G, right? Oh. And I'm going to ask the most basic of questions. I'm not going to go into conspiracy theory. I'm not going to make it complicated. Is there any truth to the fact that 5G radiation on any level can affect the body? That's the only question. I would have to take a hard pass on that. I'm okay. not well versed in them. I can, but you know what I will do for you? Smart man. I will look that up for you. I will look it up for you. I will look out. Okay. I'll make you that promise. I'll look it up for you and look, and look at some of the information that we have on the 3G networks and the 4G networks because people had been, you know, concerned about the radiation, the RF mm-hmm. radio frequency mm-hmm. radiation mm-hmm. from, you know, the old cell phones yeah. and even the batteries themselves. They give out a certain amount of radiation, which is why you so, shouldn't have it in your in your front pocket. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and all that good stuff. So I will look that up. I don't know if there's you know since it's something so new, I don't know if they're gonna have any data, but I'll I'll get that to you. How about that? That's a promise. I take that. I'll take that. All right. <laughs> 